There are a lot of lies in the Critical Drinker's latest video. A lot of smaller ones, straddling the lines between deception and willful misinterpretation, a few bigger ones, and one particularly shameless, bald-faced fib. As a matter of principle, I try my best to avoid watching this guy's videos, but someone sent me this latest one, and it kind of blew my mind. To the point that I feel a moral obligation to use my comparatively modest platform to push back against this slurry of boneheaded, brazen nonsense because it really does just lower this whole format of online media criticism. If you just want to see the main attraction, the mightiest porky, I'll put time codes in the description, but there's enough sheer bollocks before the big one rolls around that for posterity's sake, I think we better spend a bit of time just going through this mess of a video. Thanks for unpausing, and oh, glass onion spoilers by the way. The star is really quite funny. Ah, stupid people. Let's be honest, they're basically everywhere in modern culture, from politics to music to YouTube. Everywhere you look, you're confronted by vapid, brain-dead morons dispensing their unwanted and uninformed opinions like mentally challenged Delphic oracles. This is the irony note. I'm gonna play it every time the drinker says something bitingly unaware. That isn't gonna pay off immediately, but it's gonna pay off. But yeah, the first half or so of this video is pretty much just a fairly inaccurate plot recap, with some incidental Last Jedi hate. Really, really milking that one, huh? So I'm not gonna dwell on it for too long, but let's just jog through it and point out a few certified silly fella moments. Some of these are lies, some are just deceptive, but all are, yeah, silly. Before the recap even starts, the guy's going on about modern Hollywood being idiotic, and he plays a clip of Jennifer Lawrence talking to Viola Davis. Girls and boys can both identify with a male lead, but yeah. boys cannot identify with a female lead. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> This is pretty misleading. The soundbite in question went viral a while back, leading to a bunch of people trying to dunk on Lawrence and Davis for the obviously silly sentiment coming out of Lawrence's mouth. But a lot of that was thanks to precisely this kind of context stripping. See, the function the clip plays in the drinker's video is a quick example of dumb Hollywood brain, and implicitly tying this into the reactionary circle jerk around the woman king. That's what Lawrence and Davis are talking about here. Hollywood dumb is the main point here, but the sub text is because SJW. In reality, what this trimmed down clip doesn't show is what Lawrence said literally just before. We were told, girls and boys can both identify with a male lead, but yeah. boys cannot identify with a female lead. Oh, absolutely. We were told. She's recalling what studio execs told her way back when. She also thinks this is dumb. Now you could argue, and I'm sure the drinker would argue if you pointed this out to him, that okay, sure, that's the point. That the studio execs she's quoting display this dumbness. But even if so, Lawrence is talking about stuff from over a decade ago at this point. So if you're using this to set up a soapbox about how the Hollywood of today, the Hollywood that produced Glass Onion is dumb and stupid, it's really not the most relevant example. And given the way the bloke edits around the context which would support this interpretation, it's pretty clear why this is really here. But yeah, there's this, there's some Star Wars whinging. Made by a man who gleefully set out to burn one of cinema's most beloved IPs to the grounds. Tell me, how's that trilogy coming along, Ryan? Then there's some Knives Out whinging, where he claims the big problem with that mystery was the presence of coincidences. Look, I could say what a bunch of other people have said, both in response to this guy and the other Glass Onion Understander I made a video about a while ago, that coincidences are kind of pretty standard, essential even to this genre, that if there were no other angles, no red herrings, no dead ends for the detective to waddle through on their quest for the truth, stories like this would be a lot shorter, more straightforward, and more boring, but hey, why listen to me? right? You could listen to Barb Goffman though, a published mystery novelist who's written a blog post, linked below, about how there are good coincidences and bad coincidences in the genre. That bad coincidences are the ones at the end which lead to the case being solved, and the ones which happen before this to set up or deepen the mystery are kind of par for the course, and that so long as they're purposeful, they're good. If anyone watching this wants to argue that any particular coincidences in either Knives Out film don't fit this bill, you 
more than welcome to, I don't know, tweet your case to me, but I'm not gonna preemptively go over every plot beat in those films here because I'm not the one making this accusation. The burden of proof here is on the drinker, and shocker, he doesn't even bother making a case. He just says something which sounds kind of cogent in the moment, doesn't evidence or substantiate it, and carries on. You'll notice this becomes a running trend. When the guy finally gets to Glass Onion, he kicks it off by criticizing the wardrobe choices. They're not realistic enough. The most obnoxiously flamboyant wardrobe since Paul Feig stepped outside. I can't believe you think that real human beings are supposed to look like this, Ryan. Look, maybe the drink is just a huge fan of old school neorealism. Maybe he got bitten by a radioactive Cesare Sabatini. But as I'm sure most of you who have seen more than, say, two films in your life realize, realism, fidelity to everyday life, isn't really cinema's only point, and films have been stylized, way more stylized than a guy wearing a romper, for well over a century. Let's talk about another one of the video's running trends though, the guy complaining about something not being explained when there's a scene spelling it out, or about something not being included in the film when it just is. This happens a lot. The drinker takes issue with Miles Bronn's lack of concern at the uninvited Benoit Blanc turning up, and is not being kicked off immediately by Miles. You might think that an uninvited guest at an exclusive party like this would be a cause for concern, and that Miles would probably ask him to leave. But yeah, as I suggested, we actually have a whole scene explaining why this is in very simple terms. Blanc suggests another guest reset their box and invited the world-famous detective as, well, a little joke to spice up the mystery. Someone reset the box. They sent it to you as a gag. Miles is doing a murder mystery. Let's invite Benoit freaking Blanc. As we will go on to see, Miles isn't that smart, so he accepts this explanation enthusiastically. See, he's got no way of knowing Blanc's here to try and suss him out, that he knows about Andy's death. It's a possibility, but A, Miles isn't that smart, B, he's already thrown off by the seeming attendance of a ghost, which was of course the plan, and C, since there's at least a possibility Blanc knows nothing here, it is just sensible not to act weird, bar him entry now that he's here, because this is better while Blanc, he'd probably figure out that something here was off. The drinker then complains about the fact that in this world, there exists a famous detective. The world's richest man turns out to be a complete fanboy. Because I guess in this bizarro alternate world, amateur detectives are like celebrities or something. I don't fucking know. You're right there, buddy, you don't fucking know. This film, and indeed the previous film, both make it very clear that Blanc isn't an amateur. He's a high-profile, successful detective. Benoit Blanc? Oh my god, are you Benoit Blanc, the detective? Did you solve the murder of, oh, what's your name? And look, you might find that fact unrealistic for some reason, but that's not really the film's problem. Because when we're thinking about suspension of disbelief in any story, the objective isn't realism, it's verisimilitude. Basically, does an event contradict or conflict with the established rules of the world? If so, generally, that's bad. This doesn't, though. This film had already set out the fact that Blanc is very famous for his sleuthing, and had already given us the first bunch of hints that Miles isn't the smartest cookie around, hints that will only become more and more explicit as the film goes on. Within the rules of the film, this all checks out. Drinky then takes issue with the fact Miles sent a box to Andy at all. He naturally isn't on very good terms with him now. Kinda makes you wonder why he'd invite her in the first place, doesn't it? Hmm, yes, it is odd that Miles invited Andy. I wonder if the film will ever develop on this mystery. Perhaps, I don't know, it'll turn out that Miles actually killed Andy, and if that were the case, maybe we could use our brains and realize that the invitation was sent anyway to put the authorities off his scent, to make it look like an olive branch that tragically came a little too late. Gee, that'd just be swell. Also, side note, what's up with the color palette here? Half of these clips are just insanely desaturated, but I guess it's a pretty solid visual reflection of the utter lack of mental effort that's been put into this video. What next? There's a fun little Ben, why don't they make crime illegal Shapiro-esque moment, where the drinker just displays this abject fury at the idea that Glass Onion could deign to eschew the standard murder mystery formula. This is where the movie does something that absolutely pisses me off, because it's so completely out of left field and ridiculous that it absolutely ruins your investment in anything that's happening. But it turns out that Andy is in fact her identical twin sister, Helen. No way! I'm not gonna get deep into that here. My first Glass Onion video, which I'll link in the corner now, is largely about this. But TLDR, taking variation on genre conventions as aberration is not good criticism. For more, yeah, watch that video. 
There's some more light whinging about coincidences. Well, lucky she happened to have a twin sister, and that she left behind a detailed journal of her entire experiences up until this point, so that Helen would know everything she needs to blend in with her friend group. But again, these aren't coincidences that unravel the mystery, they're coincidences that set it up, that enable this story to begin, to get going. Plus, some of them aren't coincidences, they're just things that happen. It's also extremely lucky that Blanc wasn't immediately turned away from the island when he tried to blag his way in. Hey, Mr. Blanc, mm -hmm. can we have a quick word? Mm, cool. Someone reset the box. Oh, they sent it to oh, you oh, as a gag. I I've got the predefinite detective in the world at my murder mystery party. That is so legit. Also, or that the killer didn't immediately try to take Helen out when he saw that the woman he apparently already killed was now alive and well. He, he does try this. We see it. It just isn't instant, because there's a bunch of other people there, and Miles probably doesn't want them to see him murder someone. Like, goddamn, dude. The recap continues. It's a lot of drinker complaining about bad decisions Miles makes. When Andy found a crucial piece of evidence and threatened to reveal it to the world, Miles killed her and hid the evidence away in his office, instead of, you know, destroying it. Not seeming to realize that vainglorious hubristic irony is precisely dead on in character. And after all that, you, you still kept the envelope. Uh, you didn't burn it or anything? And there's a lot of just inaccuracies. And then all of Miles' friends turn against him, and they all celebrate at the end like this is some kind of epic win, conveniently ignoring the fact that they're all absolutely gonna go to jail. As I discussed in my last video, the shitheads are only celebrating when it looks like Helen's just having a tantrum. Symbolic destruction, nothing real. When it escalates, they try to stop her. After the Mona Lisa burns, they're not happy. They're resigned, bleakly accepting this new status quo. So this is wrong. Do they look happy here? They know they're boned. Critical Drinker then does a funny thing, and tries to use this film's concepts against it, against Ryan Johnson. You know, it genuinely undermines my faith in humanity that a lot of people out there consider this film a smart, well-made movie. Ryan Johnson seems to have some kind of reality distortion field around him and his work, somehow convincing people that he's this crazy auteur genius. The truth is that it's nothing but the flashy veneer of intelligence with nothing lying beneath. It's a good laugh that the dude's railing against obvious stupidity, the facade of genius, in the middle of this video's inaccuracy sandwich, but just park this irony for now because we'll return to it later. This general uh, critique keeps going. He says glass onions ruined by all the tropes, conveniences, cliches, and so on, but he doesn't give examples, explain what he means. He gave some examples earlier, remember? But it turns out that Andy is in fact her identical twin sister, Helen. But again, these are Goffman's good coincidences. So this is just more empty bluster. Then we get to, I think, my favourite point of the video. If any single one of these forced plot elements didn't happen exactly as they play out, then the whole story would have collapsed around it. The story would have fallen apart if the story beats didn't happen. I mean, yeah, that, that is true. This gives way to an anodyne avalanche of attempted nitpicks, pretty much all of which have fairly obvious answers. Let's begin. Like, what if Miles had refused to let Helen and Blanc onto his island? Wouldn't Helen's presence here with the world's most famous detective be a very obvious red flag? Again, if he does, in front of the rest, everyone, Blanc included, will definitely know something is rotten in the state of Bronn. He literally takes the first possible opportunity to interrogate Blanc because this is a red flag, but he doesn't figure out what's happening because he's not very clever. Why didn't news of the death of a high-profile tech prodigy reach the press sooner? Yet again, this is addressed. If I pull a few strings, I could keep it from leaking to the press for another week, maybe? Then. You can disbelieve a detective would have the pull to do this, but within the logic of this world, this is explained. The verisimilitude is not compromised. If Andy was so smart, why didn't she anticipate the danger she was in when Miles suddenly showed up at her home immediately after she threatened to expose him to the world? Yet again, this is addressed. Andy lets him in. Of course she did. Miles himself? Oh, she was clever enough not to fear Miles. She didn't see the real threat, the obvious threat, until it was too late. The fact Drinker omits this, or maybe doesn't understand it, is telling. It's a distillation of the, you know, whole point. The overestimation of Miles Braun and people like him. But when's he ever let the point get in the way of inane nitpicking before? 
What if one of the group had asked Helen a personal question that she should have known the answer to but didn't? I mean, I'm pretty sure Andy didn't record every single thought and event in her journal. They're avoiding talking to her. They feel very uncomfortable with her presence. We see this. It isn't a contrivance that no one grills her about her biography. And the court case was public. Blanc and Helen knew this going in. God damn, dude. What if Miles had security cameras installed in any of the house's public areas and picked up on the conversations between Blanc and Helen? The film tells us this early on. What kind of staff does it take to run a place like this? Normally, like 50, but you know. Look, I sent everyone home. Maybe there is a big security control room, but Miles isn't sitting there monitoring the house. And if you need an explanation for why that didn't happen too, might be a bit fucking sus if the guy who's invited you and your buds to his gaff sods off and watches the cameras all weekend. Especially if you get home after and see that Andy was dead the whole time. Wonder how that'd help Miles' alibi. What if Miles didn't have fax machines in all of his residencies where all of his emails and sensitive personal information got rooted? What sort of question is this? Miles' fax system is perfectly in character. It seems quirky, idiosyncratic, but it's just dumb. And more to the point, it's equal parts maddening and hilarious that these nitpicks, this critique has devolved into the drinker just asking what if this thing that happened didn't happen? What if this character was characterized differently? These aren't coincidences or contrivances, they're just parts of the story. What's the point of this? What if this? What if that? What if Andy came back from the grave and did a tap number at the film's end? What if Miles was a robot? What if they made a pizza with ice cream instead of cheese? What if they made a toilet that jacks you off? See, I can do it too. Jesus, if Matthew Arnold knew this would be the future of literary criticism, I reckon he'd have stuck to poetry. Look, this is taking ages. Let's speed through the rest. Why didn't Miles burn the napkin? We did that one already, here's the timestamp. Why did Miles shoot Helen in the notepad? He didn't know she had it, he was shooting for the chest. Why didn't Miles try to check if she was dead? He did try. Hey everyone, inside. Shouldn't we? She's not going anywhere. Why did the notepad stop the bullets? Maybe there's metal in the covers. Notepads like that exist. Also, notepad stops the bullet? That's a pretty established mystery trope. So are genre conventions good? Or is the film infuriating for subverting them? Or is the problem Glass Onion trying to have its genre cake and eat it too? If so, why is that a problem? I don't know the answer to any of these questions because the drinker doesn't give them. Why didn't he kill Blanc with Helen? Why would he kill Blanc? He doesn't think Blanc's in on it yet. In fact, Blanc's just been playing the concern card. He probably still thinks this is Andy, that she'd somehow survived, and just doesn't want her to go public with any attempted murder accusations from earlier. Is that a dumb move? Maybe, yeah, but Miles is dumb. Why are the others so far away? Why did it take everyone so long to reach the scene of her apparent death when they were only a matter of yards away? We are not shown them to be mere meters away. That isn't true. We're shown them running in all directions during the blackout chaos. Why did Blanc have a convenient bottle of chili sauce in his pocket to use as fake bloods? There's a scene that sets this up. God damn, man. Why did a guy not notice getting pickpocketed? People typically don't notice getting pickpocketed. This is not some cinematic contrivance. Honestly, one day drinker's gonna learn that this exists in the real world, that you can have something nicked from your pocket without realizing it, and it's gonna blow his goddamn mind. Yeah, Miles probably would have wanted the clear back off Blanc before he left the island, but a little after he gives it to him, distracting things start happening. Why didn't these piddly little sprinklers put out a big fire right away? I don't know about you guys, but Miles Braun, who lives in a big onion house, doesn't seem the kind of guy to have the designers for his private Greek island palace stick rigidly to fire safety codes. Why does an explosion powerful enough to level a building cause no harm to the people inside the building? Level must mean something different in Scotland, I guess. And look, nobody knows how clear powered energy pipes work. I don't, the drinker doesn't, all we can go off is what the film gives us. And the film shows the flames going up, then cuts to an explosion centered on the topmost section of the home, Miles' office, his nerve center. It seems to me that maybe this is where a lot of the energy infrastructure was installed, and that's why we see the explosion 
explosion centered here, not in the room below where the characters are. Why should they die from this? I'd love to see a paper detailing the blast radius of Unstable Claire, but since it doesn't exist, all any of us can go off is what the film gives us. And it gives us no reason to conclude the shitheads shouldn't have survived. Look, it isn't the film's job, it isn't any film's job, to explicitly, exhaustively explain everything that happens, every decision that's made. All the film has to do is establish characters and rules, from which choices and events can flow. Miles is a dummy, Blanc is a famous detective, Helen has a notepad, Blanc has the source, yada yada yada, and to avoid beats that can't reasonably be explained by an attentive viewer. Nothing the critical drinker raises here fails these criteria. He breezes past all this, obviously, to give a reason for all of these non-stupid stupid moments, and that's the following. The thing is, I know what the answer to all these questions is going to be, because the film straight up spells it out to us. It's just dumb! Everything in this script that doesn't make sense is because the people involved were just really stupid. He then follows it up with this little gem. Honestly, I have never seen such a weak, pathetic attempt to excuse terrible writing in my life. Yeah, buddy, me neither. On this point though, the whole the film being about stupidity means it is itself stupid, let me just quote myself from like a week ago. That isn't Ryan Johnson calling his own writing dumb. That's Ryan writing about the way we assume those with power are better, smarter than us, the way we give them so much credit for free. Believe it or not, there is a difference between lampshading bad screenwriting and writing a dumb character who pulls off a dumb plot, who nearly succeeds because the characters and the viewers are expecting sophistication, to set up the film's real resolution, relying as it does on this uncoupling of status and worthiness, this demystifying of wealth, material success, and great man theory. I'm gonna skip over the next section, it's just more generalized grumbling about the point of murder mysteries and how Glass Onion is wrong for not measuring up one to one to the genre's traditional conventions, because I think it's about time we got to the real meat of all this. The big one, the moment which illuminates all that's come before. As you may have noticed, there's been a ramping up of sorts throughout this video. The guy's points keep getting more and more flawed, more and more facile. The lies are getting more frequent, but they all pale in comparison to this. For context, the drink has just launched into a big complaint about the film not giving the audience the mysteries breadcrumbs for them to figure it out alongside the characters, despite the fact that it does this, Miles' malapropisms being one example, the glass pass being another, and about the characters stumbling upon the clues by accident, even though the clips he plays clearly show them intentionally sleuthing. And then he says this. And this isn't even mentioning how Ryan blatantly rewrites previous events to show you what he wants you to see instead of what actually happens. The example Drinky gives for Ryan Johnson's blatant rewriting is the scene where Blanc and as we later see Helen spot Duke's voyeurism. Batista's watching his girlfriend supposedly having an affair with Miles only to be observed by Blanc. Now look at the later version of this exact same scene. Noticed how Helen's been added in here when she totally should have been visible before. Except no, that isn't true. There's a reason the drinker plays these clips on mute. Let me put the sound back on for you. That was the first time we see this. There's a close shot of Duke, then we hear the twig snap, and then we pull back to a shot revealing Blanc. Here's the scene as we're shown it later on. We start with this slightly wider shot, revealing Blanc and Helen, then Helen leaves, causing that sound, and Duke turns round. This point is the moment we saw earlier on, and there's a very obvious, very obtrusive sound cue, the sole purpose of which is to communicate precisely this. Look, you can enjoy the way moments like this toy with the audience perspective, complementing the film's themes, these ideas of how we see and how we falsely composite and rationalize these perceptions away from the truth, away from what's really plainly shown to us, or you can dislike it. But what you can't do is lie about how the film constructs moments like these on a mechanical level. And that's what the drinker does here to cap off his video, to build into this last point. Stuff like this is lazy and cheap, and it completely undermines the integrity of the story because you know that Ryan's basically just rewriting his own rules to suit whatever he wants to happen at that particular moment. 
There is no way you can miss this. This cannot have been a mistake on the critical drinker's part. I could see that a child, or an inattentive, bored adult, half watching Glass Onion, half napping, could have got confused here, but not someone whose job it is to analyze film. So long as you don't, I don't know, mute the scene's sound, it is that obvious. Either he didn't bother to actually rewatch the scenes he's basing this critique on, thereby not spotting the obvious, in which case, yeah, that kind of says it all, or more likely, he is willfully misrepresenting this movie, lying about the basic construction of this scene, and then extrapolating that lie outwards to cover the piece as a whole. And this is baffling, right? Why even do this? Is it just because he knows his audience, knows the correct, most profitable take for him to have here is Ryan Johnson film bad, knows that saying he didn't like it won't cut the mustard, that he has to reveal some fundamental objective flaws in the film, and then panicked when he couldn't find any? Is that why he's just making up issues like this, like the hot sauce, like everything we've spent the last 20 or so minutes shoveling through? And look, none of this would matter if he were just one guy thinking these thoughts in isolation, but he isn't. This pollutes. I have a lot of viewers who also watch this guy, and when I polled the making of this video, I got a few comments like this. People who had taken Critical Drinker's word for it assumed his gripes were founded on reality, not fantasy. And this is wrong, as we've seen, but in fairness, I don't blame people like this, because why would you doubt the words of a one and a half million subscriber channel? Why would he just lie, plainly, apparently, on repeat? I don't know. How does he close the video out, anyway? A onion is like watching someone that's never played chess in their entire lives trying to take on a grandmaster, making up new rules and moves as they go to support the mistaken belief that they actually know what they're doing. It's the ego-stroking pretentiousness of a filmmaker whose aspirations and self-belief far exceed his actual abilities, and it's an insult to a genre that deserves far better than this gaudy, superficial trash. Look, I didn't really want to make this video. Between those last two She-Hulk videos, I've said all I have to say really about guys like this, but The Critical Drink has done something remarkable this time, and someone needed to point it out. That's the way he's overplayed his hand when he tried to use Glass Onion's ideas against it, tried to write his way to a conclusion that reveals Ryan Johnson as a thicko masquerading as smart, because it becomes immensely clear he'd bitten off more than he could chew. The fact that he can't get to this point without lying without fabricating problems, and complaining incessantly about the supposed absence of plainly visible explanations, the result of this is that the video ends up having the opposite effect. We see, clear as day, that it isn't Ryan Johnson wearing the Emperor's new clothes, it's him. And that's the part of Glass Onion that keeps on giving. It's like a mousetrap to commentators like this, like old Benny Boy too. It's like they see, there's a film which revolves around people thinking something dumb is smart. Haha, <laughs> no way, that's great. Great, I can just say the same thing about the film. Easy slam dunk, right? They can't resist trying it on with this film, and each time, every time, all the attempt reveals is that they're the ones whose brilliance has been taken for granted. Just before we wrap up, I know there's gonna be that guy in the comments who's gonna say something like, gee whiz, pillar of garbage, why, why are you spending so much time knocking on other people's opinions of this film? Why don't you have, have some opinions of your own? Well, great news, I do. If you wanna hear me talk more about what this film is about rather than what it's not about, I've got three videos on that already. I combined, well, like 40 minutes of content, so go check them out. Thanks for watching. Smash that like button like it's the irony key, and if I were you, I'd probably avoid the comments on this one. Today's was supposed to be that Knives Out video, that's what I was planning to upload next, but hey, you guys wanted it bumped, so that's coming out in a few days now. Also, if you're a long-time viewer and you don't really care about these films, I'll be back to business as usual very soon, so I appreciate you bearing with me, but hey, I just think they're neat. I think there's really a lot to talk about, and it seems a lot of other people agree. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters on screen now, you guys are the rops to my phase. See you around.